Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim. Join host Dan Melnick and Kasim Masood as they explore big ideas, limitless possibilities, and engage with visionaries, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who dare to dream big, get inspired, motivated, and find practical tips for personal growth. Think big, dream bigger, and ignite your potential. All right, welcome to Think Big with Dan and Cosm, and our guest today is Josh. So, Josh, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us where you live and what you do for a living. Uh, pleasure to, to join you today. So, um, I'm Josh. I am the uh, technical co-founder of Beck Health, which is a software as a service provider, uh, venture-backed in the clinical trial and life sciences space. Um, I am currently the head of customer experience, so I'm in charge of both our data science team as well as our, you would call it customer success in most other companies, but uh, we call it research services because we're ensuring that our customers are able to get value and be able to to find the patients. And uh, I am calling uh, calling in today from Wayland, Massachusetts, just outside of the Boston area. Awesome. So can you please explain to our listeners exactly what the company does and also just how you got the idea for it? Yeah. So what... Beck Health does is we fundamentally operate with under a mission that everyone, every person out there should be able to be offered the option of clinical research, um, a clinical trial. And the way we've done that is we work directly with research groups, uh, what's called private investigators and, and site management organizations and site networks that do the research. And they have partners and affiliates with uh, doctors' practices that, you know, they're in the business of delivering standard of care. Those groups offer research, they find patients and then um, who are good candidates and offer them these clinical trials. So you think about it. Hopefully this isn't too uh, uh, contentious at this point, but like back when we were doing the trials to prove the COVID vaccine, we would need to, we need to make sure that the COVID vaccine is working. So they would find patients and offer them the the trial to prove the vaccine. And this extends across all diseases. So cancer, cardiovascular diseases, respiratory disease, any type of indication out there, everything to make sure that we are giving those trials as options to give people access to medical innovation. And importantly, as it's been shown, clinically proven um, in a trial, that uh, patients get better care when they are treated in the under the, the office auspices of a clinical trial. Um, so this is also not just about advancing medical innovation, but also ensuring that people get the, the best re- care that they can. Now, how did I get into this? Well, that that's uh, a roundabout story. And um, it's funny because everyone I've ever met said they didn't get into clinical research by design. They sort of fell into it. And I'm kind of the same way. I went to grad school, I did a PhD in genetics, but I came from a a rural rural area. So I grew up in sort of rural North Carolina outside of a town called Winston-Salem. And once I went off to grad school and started doing the the PhD, any time family member or a family friend got a, a weird diagnosis or had a scare medically, ended up being go call Josh. And so I'd end up on the phone with them. Um, and frankly, I'd end up on the phone with them for hours sometimes, like talking about your, what's your medical situation? What have you talked about with your doctor? Um, what have you done? What, what questions do you have? Have you done any sequencing? Do you have any mutations for if you have the big cancer scare? So going through all of this with these individuals, and invariably, I'd end up on this website, clinicaltrials.gov, great website from the, from the government, all the trials that are out there, but it's not exactly the easiest thing to use. And so I'd be trying to match up this patient's medical history and their situation against what's out there and the trials and just realizing if I'm doing this for family, friends on a one-off basis, something's not right. And so, I mean, this has been going on for a better part of 15 years for me that I've been thinking about actually at this point, 20 years plus what's going on with clinical research and how can we improve the experience about offering trials to patients? So that's how I got into this. But then the more I got into it, the more I realized that the experience for all the stakeholders, that, that going back to the beginning, those the researchers, the PIs, the doctors who are treating these patients, the patients themselves, even the behind the scenes staff at like at a hospital, the IT staff and the compliance teams, like everything about this is just frankly inefficient. It can be done a lot better. And so kind of become a, you know, a holy mission for me. Like this is something that's just too important to, it matters 
to make sure we're getting people options, that they're getting the best care they can, and that we're making sure that research and medical innovation can proceed as fast as it, as it can. Makes sense. So can you just talk about an example of a customer use case? You don't have to mention the customer name, but like mm-hmm. how somebody's using you today with the software. Sure. Yeah, we have our core product is Vectrans, like this AI data engine behind the scenes that is performing, you and your your um, listeners probably know this is natural language processing, the, the latest generation of AIs that can read through and interpret um, text and understand what's um, being asked of it. And they use that to understand what's going on inside of the history, the medical history of individuals. So the two main things that our customers use us for is first, they want to understand if they if a trial is being brought to them, let's say a biotech wants to run a study with them, then they will use our trial feasibility solution to understand, should they even take the study on? Do they have the patience? Historically, back in the day, this was a finger in the air exercise. Lick, lick the finger and someone's saying, yeah, I think we got about five of those patients. We can probably recruit five patients for you for this study. No, very little evidence base. And it's all what's in there. It's not a lie. It's just not necessarily fully uh, with a full understanding of the details. Because and the reason why is because these trials are incredibly complex. They've got 20, 30, 40, 50 different eligibility criteria. Patient must be, you know, must be between the ages of 50 and 75. Patient must have severe this XYZ disease. They must have been on this rent many different types of medications and like literally 50 different things that's that's going on that they need to have be keeping in their head. This patient must match all of these things to be eligible. So our system allows for a comprehensive review of all of the patients in their system so that they can then decide, okay, here's the patients that match the criteria. I, as a doctor or I, as the researcher, we're going to go then have a conversation with that patient and say, this is a study that you match to, and is this a good option for you? But the first step is still, should they take the study on? Should should they sign up for it? Once they decide, okay, feasibility-wise, we can do it, then our second solution is, okay, here's those patient lists. Now, as you go, call them or reach out to them. Here's that list of patients, and you can have that conversation. Instead of spending time reviewing all the medical chart and reviewing their history, they've got that list they can be confident in and have the conversation with the patient and spend more time on building that rapport and trust about is a trial a good option for this patient instead of doing that tedious chart review. No, yeah, that's awesome. So what would you say is the biggest challenge that you face in the business today? Yeah, today, the biggest challenge is that this is upending the way research has been done, the way, at least the way our patients have been identified. Historically, the, the model was you would reach out, even in the even in the more modern age, you'd reach out to blast campaign to try and get anyone who'd be interested in research. Do you have type two diabetes? Come talk to us. We you may we may have an option for you. And then they come in and they realize, oh wait, well they didn't know about these fifteen other different criteria that needed to be included, and they don't meet those. So 80 to 90% of patients would be disqualified because of some other medical thing, a medical event. We're upending that and now providing patients that are good matches, but now have to have the conversation about, well, are you interested in research? Someone who contacted you before, you knew that they were interested in research, but they may not match. What we're working on now is how we can marry those two processes to, to understand not just that you medically match, predict that you are a good medical match, but now also, can we also identify with a higher propensity those patients who are also going to be willing to participate? Makes sense. So I guess when you say challenges kind of that you're, you know, I guess changing the way that things were being done before, it's more of just you have challenges with the adoption of these new processes, like these labs that are doing these trials or your customers, or I guess potential customers saying, hey, listen, we've been doing this for years. It's fine. We don't need to make a change. But you're basically yeah. saying, hey, listen, like you have this problem. We can help streamline it and make your lives way easier. Yes. And I'm not going to go around saying like, we're not at the point where we're just going to mystically fix all the problems. There's still work. It still requires people. This is still fundamentally about two humans connecting and saying, you're in the scariest situation you possibly have ever been. You don't have any other medical options. So we have an option here for you. And is this something you're willing to consider? And then have that conversation. And that's still fundamentally the key 
But that everything that leads up to that point is where we're upending and changing the approach. And so, yeah, someone who used to be comfortable doing things the old way, they were, as I said, they, they had a particular approach they, they were comfortable doing, and now we're changing that. So that change management, change management 101 is how we're trying to make sure that we can show that this is going to be a little bit different. It's not perfect. But man, is it going to be better for you? Makes sense. So can you just talk more about your current sales cycle? Like how do you go about acquiring new customers? And also, I'm yeah. sure there's probably like a level of information that you have to give them as well when you're speaking to them. Yeah. So we operate in sort of like a classic two-sided. Network. And what I mean by that is there are groups who are in the business of running the trials your site networks, your research organizations. And, and yes, that includes your big academic hospitals, but also a lot of groups that are out there doing research day to day. And that was our sort of classic customer. And the sales cycle with them was we are here with a solution for you. We understand your business. We understand your problems. And no one's been supporting you really that well for the last couple of decades. But here is something that's designed for you and your research coordinators and your PIs that are actually trying to recruit patients in the day-to-day. -day. And here's some patient lists. They're highly accurate. And you are going to increase your recruitment and be able to actually make your business better. Um, and what we've seen is that that's borne out. They are seeing two to four times more uh, recruitment, recruitable patients. Um, they're, I shouldn't say recruitable patients. They are recruiting two to four times more patients for their studies pre versus pre back Now we've gotten to a certain size and we've had enough success at this point that now the other side is coming in and we've got sponsors, groups who have trials they want to run. Maybe it's a study that's kind of struggling, hasn't been able to, to successfully recruit everyone. And they're coming in and saying, okay, well, we've got a study. Do you have patients? Do you have anyone that you know that could run this study for us and help us ensure this, get this trial back on track? And so that side is now we've had the solution we call the Beck Network, where we can play matchmaker. We can help introduce the pharma or the biotech or the med device company to locations that have patients that we know have patients based off their EMR data and say, okay, y'all come together, come to an agreement. And we've made the played matchmaker and we're going to then uh, help them run the study um, and be able to recruit patients for that study. So it actually helps both parties. Um, yeah. So do you charge both parties per month? Like what does a pricing structure look like? Again, the, the classic uh, site networks, they'll pay a subscription to run a certain number of studies and for us to process data for them, process to allow our AI to read through the medical histories. So they pay a certain subscription for that. And then, but they don't pay for any of the Beck network studies where we bring in the sponsor. The sponsor will then cover the cost to have the Beck health service run uh, for that particular study. So do they pay like per user per month or like, what does that look like approximately? I mean, like how much like they're, they're, they're uh, paying you? Yeah. So it's, it's not a per user. Uh, it's not seat license based. It's based off of a, a consumption model. So number of the way we, there's three, three drivers for us. How many medical record systems are we connected into? How many patient lives, just how much data are we processing for them? And then how many trials are they run? And so we help to, uh, in, to in those places and that's where they they base their subscription off of and then for the sponsors it's uh, more based off of how many patients are we identifying for them and then ultimately are they enrolling into the study makes sense so obviously now 2024 is around the corner so what would you say is your goal i mean revenue goal like where you want to get to for next year yeah so we are uh we're growing quickly so we actually uh went 6x from uh 2021 to 20 22 and we've uh, now doubled um, in revenue for from 22 to 23. We're looking to uh, about double again next year. So it's you know big goals and we're excited. So yeah, that that's our goal for 24. But uh, I'll leave it at that. What would you say is like your biggest obstacle preventing you from where you're at now to doubling for next year? As much success as we've had, I think our biggest uh, challenge is going to still be about the awareness piece. This is we're still kind of a market maker here. Um, there's, yeah, it's this, this issue about trying to get others aware that this is a solution that exists, that it works, 
and uh, that, uh, you know, we look at, we can introduce you to other groups that have had success and can uh, show you that it does actually, that we're not just making this up. This isn't vaporware. This is actually a proven uh, solution that will help with uh, with their needs, with their issues. So for the awareness piece, like, do you run ads? Like, you know, what has been successful in getting in front of your potential customers and making them aware of what you're doing? Yeah. So it's, it's less about ads. It's been, I would say our biggest success has been around the conference circuit. So it, it's such a niche space that uh, still up to this point, I think it's been more about um, the awareness comes from being out there in the, the marketplace at the conferences saying, and here we are, and here's here's what we can do. So, yeah. That makes sense. So it's like all of your, you're saying basically all of your customer acquisition has come primarily from going to these niche conferences where you're talking to your potential customers. Like you haven't done any cold email or LinkedIn outreach, just been from speaking. So we do, we do your, all your cold outreach. We do a lot of like LinkedIn uh, creating content, um, both in LinkedIn and blog posts and white papers, but that might be the starting point. Um, but still, I think really this is very much relationship driven. So it comes to fruition when we have the chance to sit down and meet and, and talk in person. Makes sense. So when you're getting, for example, the data from these networks, you know, do you deal with something like HIPAA compliance, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, yeah. I'm sure that probably some patients that they have to essentially opt in to be in your network, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, and that's, that's true. So, and that was a major component of the early years of us ensuring that we are HIPAA and high trust compliant, that we have gone through uh, quite a number of penetration tests and third party audits. We've been audited by multiple customers, including multinational corporations to make sure that we are compliant regulatorily from a privacy standpoint, um, as well as being secure. And we had to, I mean, listen, we're being entrusted with very important, sensitive information. Um, We want to make sure that there is absolute protection and that uh, we are taking a very serious uh, look at our security and privacy positioning and as well that anyone who wants to is able to opt out. Listen, like if you're telling us you are not interested in research, then okay, absolutely. You can opt out. We will not just, we will allow you to, you can opt in and you can opt out at any time. That's awesome. So what would you say is the one biggest piece of advice that you wish you knew before you started this company? I've worked at multiple startups Previously, I've worked at effectively a startup inside of a bigger company. Um, I've worked at a startup very early on, um, but still, you know, in that A round, it is very different being at at employee one. the The bit of advice I would give is. It's not just that you have to have grit. You have to have grit. You have to believe in what you're doing. But what I've seen is you need to have a perspective. And this is where I think it comes from my consulting background. You need to understand who you're solving a problem for. And I don't mean just like, you know, know them. I mean, you need to understand their day to day. You need to understand what it meant for us, at least. I'm going to give you an example. What does it mean to run a trial? Like I worked at Quintiles and I I didn't really, the world's largest CRO, I didn't really understand what it meant to run a clinical trial until I got into a research site and understood what it meant for means a patient showing up and it means Blood's going to get drawn just like in a doctor's office, but that blood is going to be used for a test for this clinical trial. They're collecting data. They, they're When they are looking for patients for a study, they've got three monitors and a binder open on their desk where they're like looking and saying, okay, is this, does this match and this, then this, and this, and like doing that exercise across hundreds of patients, across 10 different studies, each of them with their own criteria. And that is maybe if you're lucky, 20% of their time where they're also trying to, they're not just recruiting for the study, they're running the study, they're trying to make sure the visits, the people are coming in and they're being scheduled, they're being reminded that all the data is being taken care of, that they're keeping up on their trend. Like there's so much going on that you really have to understand Grok, their entire situation to really have a perspective on how you're going to solve their problem. Again, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a wonk. I'm a tech guy. Like I have, believe in AI and its power, but if I just came at this from only a technology perspective, from only we're going to drop a piece of technology off on your doorstep and good luck with it, we're going to fail. We had to understand what their issues were and why they needed and how they were going to use us if we were going to actually help. That makes sense. No, 100%. Because I think, you know, you did it the right way because many people are trying to, quote unquote, so you know, solve, you know, like, I guess, like, create something and maybe 
hopefully solve a problem, right? You're solving yeah. a problem that you know exists because you understand the market. You have the same issues that you went in. I'm sure you probably, you know, did interviews and talked to people. So I think it's like when you understand end to end the industry and the business and the problem that you're solving, that makes it way more smooth sailing, 100%. Yeah. And, and, and listen, like, again, as a scientist, I don't claim to have all the answers. Like, I know there's things I don't know, and I've got to come at it with that humility. Like, the point of focusing on customer experience is how can I meet someone where they are and how can I improve their situation? And that means I have a perspective, but I've also got to make sure to keep my mind open to new information they might not be expecting. 100%. So if somebody watching this wanted to reach out to you, do you mind sharing your company website or social yeah. media, just best way to get in contact with you? Yeah. So uh, www.beckhealth.com and that's uh, B-E-K-H-E-A-L-T-H. So Bravo Echo Kilo, uh, Hotel Echo Alpha, Lima Tango Hotel.com. Um, you can also uh, ping us at info at BeckHealth.com. We also are on uh, LinkedIn uh, at Beck Health. Look forward to uh, anyone who contacts us. We'd love to help you. Sounds great. Well, Josh, it was a pleasure and thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. All right. Bye.